So now we move on to Homo floriensis. Homo floriensis is a really, like, I don't know, I really like it. I think it's a really great fossil. And it's nicknamed the Hobbit after J.J. Um, J. R. Tolkien's um, Lord of the Rings as well as the Hobbits. Um, yeah, so Homo floriensis was discovered in 2003 and they found, they're found found only in this one cave on the Isle of Flores in Indonesia and it's thought that they lived around 100 to 50,000 years, um, years ago and that is during the late Pleistocene and we now know that Homo floriensis, there was about 12 individuals and we know this from their skeletal material and they had a body size ranging from 0.9 to 1.1 meters they had a small brain capacity, smaller teeth they had an absence of a chin and differences with the humeral head and their small stature is thought to be because of insular dwarfism so when an island for example gets cut off the organisms either become really really large which is known as insular gigantism or they become tiny due to insular dwarfism, which is what is thought to have happened here. So alongside Homo floriensis, we also find dwarf elephants um, and dwarf rhinos. And it's kind of debated where Homo floriensis would have been on the tree. Um, and we really don't know how it's related to other genuses of Homo. And the disappearance of Homo floriensis kind of co coincides with Homo, uh, with, Neanderth with the Neanderthals extinction from Europe around 40,000 years ago and disappearance of Homo floriensis kind of was within 5,000 years after the arrival of anatomically modern humans so that is kind of us in our like uh, like so Homo sapiens are what what I know them as as anatomically modern humans uh, so that's what I will be referring to them for the rest of this talk um, so, Homo floriensis kind of disappears within 5,000 years of the arrival of anatomically modern humans on Flores. And we also have really cool evidence of stone tools being manufactured and used by these, um, by these um, humans. And this is a kind of a problem that we can't really call them the hobbits anymore. Um, this was because um, in October 2012, a New Zealand scientist was doing a talk on them and he was told by the Tolkien estate that he was not allowed to use the word hobbit within pro uh, for promoting the lecture which yeah I, I understand but it's kind of not cool and it's thought that so on the right here we have the kind of complete ske uh, skeleton and it's thought that this skeleton by numerous researchers it they thought they had down syndrome and that's probably why it had um, the smallest stature, etc, etc. And um, the remains of the other individuals at Flores were just anatomically modern human. However, these claims have just been shut down. So it isn't that they showed Down syndrome, it's just the fact that they were um, they were just due, uh, because of insular dwarfism. And it's kind of this idea of it having dwarf, uh, having um, Down syndrome is kind of being um, shut down because Homo floriensis contains numerous characteristics that are shared by both, um, by all the individuals that we know of Homo floriensis. Um, so it isn't likely that um, the species was just numerous people with Down syndrome, whereas it's most likely that it was its own species and it isn't it was just a dwarfism thing um so we now move on to homo lives on Ensis. so this was a really recent recent um sorry it's getting really dark here for some reason um this is a really really recently published on uh, human species so it was discovered in, discovered in 2010 and it was published on in 2019 and it's thought and it's it's only been found in Luzon in the Philippines and it lived at um, 0.067 to 0.05 million years ago during the late Pleistocene and we can know this from seven teeth and six small bones and it has a presence of 
traits that related to modern humans as well as Australopithecines as well as early humans. So the teeth look really similar to those of modern humans, um, whereas the foot bones are similar to those of humans. Uh, no, they're similar to those of um, Australopithecuses. So these feet bones are the only one within the genus Homo to be similar to that of Australopithecuses. And these, like the um, Homo floresiensis, are small in stature, and this is thought to be also because of insular dwarfism. And what's weird about Homo luzonensis is that the island of Luzon has always been an island, even during the Pleistocene. So it's kind of, we're not really sure how Homo luzonensis got there. Um, so we have one group of people saying that they rafted there accidentally, or they were actively exploring the region. So now we move on to Homo antecessor. So Homo antecessor um, was first found in 1994 and they are primarily known from Western Europe and they lived around 1.2 million years ago to 800,000 um, years ago during the early Pleistocene. And they're first known from the Sierra de um, Atapuerca in Spain, in the Grandolina Cave. And um, the 800 KYA material has been assigned to Homo antecessor um, because the 1.2 million year old can kind of be, um, we're not really sure whether it was in fact antecessor or not. However, they are known to be the first humans to have ranged into Western Europe. So outside of Spain, um, the only other evidence of Homo antecessor are 50 footprints found in um, Happisborough in England. And these footprints are also dated to 1.2 million to 800 KYA. And they are attributed to um, an antecessor group. And this is because it was the only human species identified during the time of those footprints being made in Western Europe. And um, it's thought that um, Homo antecessor was the last common ancestor um, of both Neanderthals and anatomically modern humans. And however, a study done in 2017 found that Homo antecessor may not be an ancestor of an anatomically modern human, but probably split from the branch quite shortly after, uh, before the anatomically modern human stroke Neanderthal split. So it's kind of like just a little offshoot before the split of Neanderthals and anatomically modern humans. So next we move on to Homo heidelbergensis. And these were first discovered in 1908. And they, um, the first fossil was found in Germany, and that is a dentary bone, which is the jawbone. And they've been found in Europe, China, as well as Eastern and Southern Africa. And they lived at 0.7 to 0.2 million years ago during the Middle Pleistocene. And we know that Homo heidelbergensis had a very large brow ridge, as you can probably see on the fossil there. And it also had a large brain case, as well as a flattened face, as well as short and wide bodies. And we think that the short, wide bodies was um, due to them living in colder climates, as they are the first early human species to live in colder climates. And Homo heidelbergensis is kind of associated with the oldest definite control of fire, as well as um, the use of wooden spears, as you can see bottom right. Um, it was the first species to build shelters as well um, as well, by creating the shelters out of wood and rock. And also, so it's the first species that we know of to actively um, hunt large animals, so routinely by completely going back and back and hunting large animals. And we know this is uh, we know this because of evidence that comes from these wooden spheres on the right here which are found in um, Germany. However, these spears are also attributed to early Neanderthals. However, it's kind of debated as to which group used them. Um, so the comparison of Neanderthal and anatomically modern human DNA 
suggests that um, the two lineage lineages come from a common ancestor, which is most likely to be Homo heidelbergensis. And um, this kind of split between 350,000 to 400,000 years ago. And um, so Homo heidelbergensis was also found in Africa, uh, which I think I've put on that one. Yeah, in Africa. And the European branch of Homo heidelbergensis split to be Neanderthals, and the African branch of Homo, um, Homo heidelbergensis led to Homo sapiens. And the, a key locality from Homo Homo heidelbergensis is Boxgrove in Sussex in England and we found um, tibia, two teeth as well as um, flint artifacts and animal artifacts so we have flint artifacts such as this hand, gro uh, hand, hand, gro hand axe from Boxgrove and the animal artifacts show um, cut marks as well as um, kind of like percussion which is where things have beaten them. So now we move on to our most kind of common, uh, our most recent ancestor, and this is Homo neanderthalensis. Um, so we know these as the Neanderthals, and they were the first hominin species to be named, um, and they were discovered in 1829. And we know that they've lived across Europe as well as in southwest and central Asia, and um, they lived around 400,000 to 40,000 years ago. And the way that we used to see Neanderthals, and some people still do, and it's quite offensive, <laughs> that Homo neanderthalensis, is, so Neanderthals were dim, slow, cavemen, they were primitive, as you can see in this bottom right picture, which is just horrible. <laughs> um, and whereas we now know that they are like a lot more caring, they're a lot more like us, and they are our closest extinct human relative and we know this from fossil and genetic evidence and it suggests that we evolved from a common ancestor between 700,000 and 300,000 years ago and Neanderthals most likely went extinct due to um, kind of interbreeding with us so they were bred to extinction as well as climate change, disease or a combination of these factors. Um, and so they have different, they have characteristics that are kind of similar to us, but different. So they have a long, low skull with the prominent brow ridge above their eye. The central part of the face protruded forwards and was dominated by a very big, wide nose. And they didn't really have much of a chin. They also have larger teeth when compared to our teeth. They also have wide hips and shoulders hips and shoulders, as well as shorter lower leg and lower arm bones. And all of these characteristics are thought to be adaptations for colder climates. And it's thought, kind of, if you were to shave a Neanderthal and put them in modern clothes, they would pass completely unnoticed, which I think is really interesting because, um, I don't know, there's just something about Neanderthals that I really enjoy, like, learning about, and I've, I've always really liked Neanderthals, so I think it'd be really cool that you could just pass by one unnoticed. And so they use this technology called Mustarian. And this is um, kind of the old Stone Age um, technology. And it's lasted roughly around 160,000 to 40,000 years BP. And we know that there are around 60 plus different tool types that have been produced by Neanderthals. And it involves a um, napping technique known as Lavalois hopefully that plays, Brill. So here on the um, right, we have a little like gif of a Lavalois napping technique. So what they do is they strike um, the piece of flint at one end and then they flake off around the edges and then they um, flake around the outline of what they want to use the flint for. And it creates like a dome shaped on the side of the core. And then when the striking platform is hit, so wait one sec. So when the striking platform is hit now, um, a lithic flake separates from the core, and all of its edge and edges are sharpened by the later trimming work, which I think is really really cool. And we know that. Um, so this is kind of what we refute the idea of Neanderthals being dumb, primitive 
brutes. We now know that Neanderthals looked after their sick as well as buried their dead. So, um, for example, we have um, Shanadar 1, which is from the Shanadar cave in Iraq. And this Neanderthal specimen has a um, disabled arm. It, it, he was likely deaf, as well as having head trauma that rendered him um, partially blind. And we, like scientists have been able to estimate that he lived up until 35 to 45 years of, old, uh, years of age, which is really old um, for a Neanderthal. So it's thought that he lived to this age because the Neanderthals cared for him and um, his social group looked after him, provided him with food, um, as well as, you know, hunting, cooking, whatever they did for him. We also know that they had jewellery and um, there's a really, really nice example of this um, eagle um, necklace. So they have um, talons from eagles and they've got perforated holes in. And the oldest examples of Neanderthal jewellery were around 130,000 years ago, um, years old. So they also pierced animal teeth and worked ivory, which would have been used to make jewellery. We also know that they produced art. So um, there's this, there's evidence for Paleolithic, which is Neanderthal and early modern humans, artwork in Spain, which is made by Neanderthals. And the reason why we know that it's made by Neanderthals because, is because um, because humans, we know that we know that early anatomically modern humans did do cave paintings, but we know that it was done by Neanderthals in this cave because they were dated to a time like a lot longer before anatomically modern humans were in the region. So here we have the example. So we have an engraving found in um, Gorham's cave in Gibraltar. And then we also have this cave painting, which is kind of thought to be a ladder um, from the La Pisienga cave in Spain. And we think that the animals, um, as you can see, like that cow um, at the bottom of the ladder, it's thought that they were added later by anatomically modern humans. And then here we have this absolutely beautiful specimen of um, eagle talons. So there are eight overall, and it's from a Neanderthal site in present day Croatia. And it's been found that these eagle talons had notches as well as poli polished facets and um, were smoothed. And it's thought that these notches would have had like a piece of string through them or whatever they use to make a, uh, to make a necklace. And so now we move on to this kind of enigmatic species that we, yeah, they're known as the Denisovans, so everyone's probably heard of them. And they were found in 2010. And we know that they may have ranged from Siberia to Southeast Asia. And they they were first found in the Siberian Denisovan cave, Denisova cave, which is kind of only where they're known from now. And we only really know them from a few remains. And what we know from them primarily comes from DNA evidence, which is really, really cool that we don't have that much fossils, but we're able to be a we're able to know what, um, like who they were, who they were, and what they look like due to DNA evidence. So, it DNA evidence suggests that Denisovans are related to both Neanderthals and modern humans, and may have interbred. And then, what's weird is that Denisovans show the closest relationship to modern indi um, indigenous peoples of Australia and New Guinea, which is really, really weird, but it's really cool. And we now know that there are fossils of eight distinct Denisovan individuals, including one Denisovan Neanderthal hybrid, which is so cool that we're able to distinct uh, that we were able to get DNA and figure out that we had um, a Denisovan Neanderthal hybrid. So now we move on to Homo sapiens, which is our own species. So we first evolved in Africa, and we now live everywhere <laughs> and we evolved around 300,000 years ago and we are the only extant species of um, homo and anatomically modern humans spread out around the world around 40,000 years ago and we would have met Neanderthals in Europe and Asia and quite a lot of um, DNA evidence suggests that approximately one to four percent 
of the genomes of non-African modern humans as Neanderthals. So, for example, so as Africans would not have met Neanderthals, they don't have that um, DNA. Whereas, for example, European, we have quite high percentages of um, Neanderthal DNA in our um, in our uh, genome. It's odd because people suggest that um, the Neanderthal DNA gave you red hair. So if you're a ginger, um, Neanderthals gave us that, but that's since been refuted. And Homo sapiens are characterised by a lighter build of skeletons compared to earlier humans. We have large brains, which has since reorganised the skull to be thin-walled, high-volted, uh, with a flat or near vertical forehead. We kind of have a reduced, if any, uh, brow ridge and um, we also have um, less heavily developed jaws with smaller teeth. And so here's the timeline of um, Homo sapiens. So 300,000 years ago, fossils of the oldest Homo sapiens were found, uh, have been found. 210 to 100,000 years ago, fossils show Homo sapiens lived outside of Africa. 164,000 years ago, modern humans were collecting and cooking shellfish. 90,000 years ago, modern humans have begun making specialised fishing tools. 60 to 50,000 years ago, genes and climate reconstructions show a migration out of Africa, again. Um, 40,000 to 15,000 years ago, genetics and fossils show Homo sapiens became the only surviving human species. And then 2,000 years ago, Homo sapiens made the trend transition to producing food and changing our surroundings so 2000 years ago we moved to the farming to farming and um yeah farming and um kind of having a stable place of living during the mesozoic uh mesozoic mesolithic <laughs> and so here we have this really useful kind of infographic showing the difference between modern humans, Denisovans and Neanderthals, which I've also included on the handout sheet. And this was done by um, Jason Treat for Cell. Uh, Cell is a paper uh, or journal. And so here we also have another um, kind of visualization of the temporal time, the temporal time, the temporal ranges of our evolutionary tree. So now we move on to the, the key um, like the key transition that occurred. So bipedalism evolved much earlier in time than other features um, of humans, including large brains. So this led to an anatomical changes in all parts of the human body. So for example, the pelvis, the, um, the skull, the, the spine. And the first evidence of bipedalism we know comes from the oldest hominid, ske uh, hominid skeletons at six to, six, uh, six to four million years ago. And there's that trackway in Laetoli that we talked about, um, which is dated to 3.75 million years ago. And it's thought that bipedalism probably arose around eight to nine million years ago within the hominid line when our ancestors split from the forest dwelling Miocene apes. And the bipedalism is kind of thought to, um, the reason why bipedalism occurred was thought to be because of the evolution of the savannah and these savannah mosaics. And the savannah mosaics are like open grassland, um, like swampy areas, forests. And um, they believe that bipedalism might have been because they wanted to spot predators as well as walk through the savannah mosaics. And the bipedalism skeleton changes, so the foot becomes more flat, less convex, um, with a non-opposable big, uh, big toe, as well as straight phalanges, and phalanges are the um, bones of the toes, and the, well, the foot bones, really. The angle of the knee shifts from being slightly splayed to being straight, um, because, for example, if you look at a chimpanzee walking, they have, they're have they pretty bow-legged. Um, all of the leg bones are longer. The hip joint faces downwards and sidewards. And the pelvis is short and bowl-shaped. 
The spine is a curved S shape and in the skull the occipital condyles and the foramen magnum are placed beneath the skull instead of behind the skull. So here we have um, a really useful diagram of um, a gorilla and a human. So the gorilla is the red boxes and the humans are B boxes, uh, B boxes, blue boxes. So as you can see the differences in um, the differences in um, adaptation for bipedalism. For example, the, uh, the pelvis is a lot shorter um, than in, in the humans than in the gorilla. And another trend that occurred was brain size increase. And we know that this occurred much later than bipedalism. And the brain size increase occurred around 2 million years ago. And it's only within the genus Homo that this has occurred. So on average, the size of a primate's brain is nearly double what is expected for mammals of the same body size. And across nearly 7 million years, the human brain, so the hominin, no, the homo brain, has tripled in size. Uh, the, for example, early bipedal humans, their brain size was 4, 400 to 550 centimetres cubed, whereas with us, the anatomically modern human, their brain, our brain size is 1,000 to 2,000 centimetres cubed, with the mean brain size being 1,360 uh, 1, centimetres cubed. Um, with the brain size increase, it led to the brain case being enlarged, the face becoming less protruding and um, placed beneath the brain. So, it, for example, in, the, in a chimpanzee, the face uh, kind of does this and their brain is behind the face. Um, and a solely human character is the um, teeth arc with no gap between the canine and the incisors. So if you look at your jaw, you can see that it's kind of like a curved shape like that. Whereas, um, and that is a solely human character. And it's generally thought that human evolution followed a locomotion first pattern so this was bipedalism arising around 7 million years ago with the enlarged brain um, arising less than 2 million years ago. So for example, here we have a skull of Australopithecus afarensis, um, which is similar to that of the modern chimpanzee. Then we ho have Homo erectus, which has a larger brain uh, with smaller jaws and teeth. And then, uh, then we have Homo sapiens, which has the larger brain and smaller jaws and teeth with the less protruding face and um yeah with the less protruding face and a reduced brow ridge so another trend that we see within the fossil record is tool use and the first evidence of tools being used is at least 3.3 million years ago and we know this because of accumulated debris from making and using these stone tools and it's um, we know that stone tools were being used because they're less susceptible to destruction than to bones and stone artifacts usually offer the best evidence for where and when early humans lived and the only problem with stone tools is since multiple human species often existed at the same time, it can be difficult to determine which species made which tools. And um, we now know that chimpanzees, well, we know that chimpanzees are um, creating weapons and tools. For example, um, they've made spear-like weapons for hunting and they also have specialised toolkits. And it suggests that our family tree may have utilised wooden tools since the ancestors of humans and chimps diverged at 4 million years ago. So um, here, are we, here we have some, um, yeah, so here we have some um, different stone tool technologies. We have the um, older one, which is the low, lower Paleolithic period, 2.6 to 1.7 million years ago. And these are simple, usually made with one or a few flakes chipped off the side with, um, of the rock with another stone and we now we know that the makers of um, older one tools were mainly right handed which is really cool because that's how um, the right hand kind of became the dominant hand to use. We also have the um, Akiluyet, oh my goodness I can't pronounce that, um, 
8 Ulian, which is lower Paleolithic, which is um, 1.76 to 0.13 million years ago. And these are characterised by distinctive oval and pear-shaped hand axes. And we know that um, this type of technology is found with Homo erectus uh, remains primarily, but it's also known from Homo heidelbergensis, and it's thought that Homo heidelbergensis used it before adopting um, the Mousterian. And the Mousterian technology is Middle Paleolithic, so 160,000 to 40,000 years ago, and it's associated primarily with the Neanderthals, and um, they use Mousterian as well as Chateauperonian technology, as well as the earliest um, anatomically modern humans. And Mousterian um, tools we kind of touched upon earlier, but they also they were primarily hand axes, racklers, and points. So here we have an um, example of an adult male chimpanzee and what he has is he's got a stick that he's um, licked and he uses the stick to dip for ants in a ant nest which is a really ingenious way of getting ants because the ants will stick to the, um, to the twig and then um, kind of makes like a kebab almost of ants um, for the chimpanzee to enjoy. And then we also have um, on the right um, a diagram showing all the different stone tools and we know that the, stu the stone tools increased in complexity during the Pleistocene um, and then after 50,000 years ago um, we also find bone, antler and ivory tools becoming common as well as these, um, rock, uh, these stone tools. And then finally the last trend that we are going to talk about is migration. So um, this is a modern humans out of Africa and um, the only problem with this diagram is in the Americas there's just been a paper out stating about um, like the time for humans anatomically modern humans in America to be pushed back um, which I can link in um, the like further reading bit so the humans into America is really controversial um, just because of the fact that there's new evidence being found and pushing it back and back and back. And the record of human evolution seems to show an ever quickening pace of evolutionary change. And this is because we are such a young group, technically, we are a really young group. And major innovations occurred, uh, so we had like bipedalism, enlarged brains, stone, uh, stone tools, wide geographic distribution, fire, art, and then finally agriculture and the beginning of a global population increase. So human evolution, it's really, it's like a bit of a muddle, but we know quite a lot about it. And there are loads of trends which we can follow and we have a great like evolutionary um, timeline of them all. So we can be able to look at a certain age, at the fossils there, and be able to understand what innovations that these groups had. So as always, you can contact me on here. Um, it's been such a nice, like such a pleasure working with you all for this um, during this course, and I hope that you've all learned something. Um, you've all really enjoyed it. Please let me know if you need anything. So yeah, please just let me know. Um, I can't even say see you all next week.